we are at the last lecture, not only uh, uh, for me, but uh, for everybody. Um, all right, so um, we saw lots of stuff. Uh, I'm not going to, to recap all of it uh, and just uh, get into talking about the most creatively named uh, lecture of all, which is further symmetric primitives. <laughs> Okay, and uh, you know, so this is, I'm basically going to give a uh, kind of reasonably high level overview of some of the work I've been doing, uh, which is a, a little bit self-centered perhaps, but uh, part of the goal here is to hopefully get you excited about the, the possibility of research, cool research questions that arise at the interface between uh, applications and, and cryptography, right, that we don't have uh, all the solutions. Uh, we saw, you know, these things with symmetric encryption, uh, which is kind of a primitive we've known about for a long time, and then we recast it to have uh, non-spaced uh, symmetric encryption. Um, and that uh, provides some added uh, benefits, but doesn't really change the, the goal of the, the secure channel mechanism that we have. For our preserving encryption, we had to deal with the system constraint and change our goals, right? Unfortunately, to be a little bit less uh, secure, but still trying to do the best possible given the constraints. And uh, we're going to see that theme continue, right? That we're going to work around systems constraints in these uh, various further symmetric uh, primitives. Okay. So, what am I going to talk about? I'm going to start off with talking about passwords and how we deal with the fact that in real systems uh, we can't always assume we have a good key. Right? Uh, and uh, I'll talk about uh, uh, two uh, things there, which is uh, you know kind of the classic approach of dealing with this PKCS number five, uh, and how this gives rise to actually some new theory questions, how to model the security that's actually being targeted by these constructions, and then I'll talk about some very new stuff, uh, honey encryption, um, which is looking at kind of orthogonal way of, of dealing with uh, bad passwords. I'll talk about format transforming encryption, which is was directly inspired by this work on FP and particularly the ability to have format preserving encryption schemes that uh, you can have a programming interface where you give it a regex and, and it goes and does ranking for you with that. Uh, and then uh, I wasn't sure if I was going to have time or not, so we'll see if I have time, then I'll get to uh, this uh, message locked encryption uh, work, which is uh, trying to treat building symmetric encryption schemes that allow outsourced stores to do uh, deduplication over ciphertext. Okay, so. Yeah, I already said this, right? Basically, all of these things are going to address deficiencies in conventional encryption uh, for very specific contexts. Okay? And so, to provide some of the kind of backdrop, high level motivation, why are we dealing with these things? Well, here's some examples of places where symmetric encryption conventionally doesn't, uh, doesn't cut it for us. So, one example is uh, with these uh, is this internet censorship. Uh, the problem is that we have uh, secure, our secure channel protocols are actually easy to detect by network sensors, right? They're actually looking at packets as they go over the network. It's very easy to detect that TLS is running, okay? And that allows them to block encryption mechanisms and therefore uh, uh, apply, you know, very, uh, then censor uh, unencrypted uh, connections as well. Uh, you know, we have situations with outsource stores like uh, Dropbox and they have they do uh, encryption of, of the data that you upload, but they do it on the server side with keys that they retain, which uh, some people were very surprised about, I guess, when they, they found out about this. I don't know why. It seems like the natural approach, given what they're doing. Uh, and part of the reason they do that is that, uh, you know, they have to do a lot of stuff with plain text, but one of the, the issues that they want to, that they need to have encryption keys for is they want to do deduplication. So if two people upload the same file, they only want to store one copy of it. And symmetric encryption would ruin the efficiency of that. Uh, and then finally, uh, with passwords, right, uh, we have a big issue that, you know, if you use the wrong type of password-based encryption scheme, or even a good one, uh, at least in the conventional sense, it's very easy to crack these encryptions, right? That if you enumerate a dictionary of uh, likely passwords, well, the most common password, there's actually a news article about this, uh, came out last week, some company did another survey of most common passwords. And I guess we were seeing huge improvement because the most common password moves something from like, one, two, three, four, five to one, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> I'm just like, yay! It's <laughs> amazing. All right. <laughs> so, not much entropy. And, and most of the, all the studies of these password leaks, which actually took advantage of, 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 of various situations in which companies had their databases exposed, and password databases exposed. These analyses of these leaks show that, you know, the min entropy, the unpredictability, the most, most likely password is very low. It's like 1%, one, 1%, right? Which means that, uh, 
It's very easy to start uh, guessing people's passwords. We've known for a long time, but there's been good quantification of, of this uh, empirically in the last bunch of years. Okay, and that gives us problems uh, uh, as well. And I'll get to this kind of nuance uh, in a minute. Okay, cool. So, uh, yeah, right. So we're going to try and deal with each of these things piecemeal with uh, trying to use new, change our encryption goals to deal with these types of issues. And uh, which means we have to not only change definitions, but also change the constructions and change our viewpoint, which is kind of, kind of cool. Okay, so let's start with password-based encryption. Actually, the last thing on that list. Uh, so, you know, normally we have conventional encryption with keys. People don't pick good keys, they pick passwords, and they pick them poorly, as I just explained. Okay, and so for simplicity, we can just imagine that we have uh, some set of passwords that people are drawing from, even, even if you draw it uniformly, but it's a small set of something like 10 to the 6, right? So what's the obvious attack for, uh, for cracking a, a ciphertext if you're obtaining? Exhaustive search, yeah, dictionary attack, brute force attack. Oh, hey, it's me again. I forgot. <laughs> now I'm going to forever think this is me because uh, of Kenny. Thank you so much, Kenny. <laughs> Wonderful. All uh, right. So, uh, uh, so here I am, <clears throat> uh, brute forcing a, a ciphertext C that I've been given. And uh, yeah, this is the brain dead thing, right? You enumerate all the passwords. Uh, password crackers, of course, do this cleverly by picking, they order the passwords, but by most likely, you start with one, two, three, four, five, six, and, and go from there. Uh, and you generate a bunch of messages that, uh, from this process. And uh, what, does, what this ends up with? Well, you end up with a list of stuff. If you're using a, a conventional you know, password-based encryption scheme, what do you get? You get a bunch of random data when you have the wrong key, and when you have the right key, you have the right message, which I guess actually that's not even the end of the lecture. Where <laughs> I think I'm over-promising here. Uh, probably not going to quite uh, make it. Uh, it's, it's not beer, tea, meat, five man, just in case you're reading it wrong. Anyway, but the point is that it's clear to see which is the right, uh, the right plain text, right? And, and, and so, we, uh, and this is exactly how these attacks work. Okay. Except if you yep. make sure you can decrypt the two lightly, or not, to two uh, 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 plain English looking uh, texts. Right. Uh, which is, is exactly the intuition we're going to take advantage of in honey encryption. This is an old folklore idea, right? Let's try and make this second thing hard to do, picking out the, the right message. So you're getting ahead of me, and that's good. Um, Conventional PB, like PKCS number five encryption does not do this, right? They run CBC mode uh, over using a key uh, uh, derived from your password into salt that's chosen randomly. I guess I'm going to show you some slides in the issues. Well, I'll, I'll get there in a second. Just uh, stay tuned and you can see why it uh, doesn't uh, provide uh, what you're uh, looking for. Okay, so what, what can we do with this? And we're going to look at two things, right? One is the conventional approach that's used in practice now, which is exactly this PKS-CS5 approach, which is that uh, you try to at least slow down this brute force attack as much as possible. And how do you do that? Yeah, iterations, right? You, you take your password and you hash it a bunch of times uh, with assault, uh, and then you encrypt with that password, uh, with the uh, result of all those hashes, okay? And the idea is, the theory is that you have to do all those hashes to compute the key to actually do the inversion. Okay, and this is used widely in practice. This other idea is this, this folklore idea that you just mentioned, right? Which has been taken advantage of in some, some narrow contexts. Uh, and we've been recently working on trying to give it a more kind of foundational approach that you can, as a framework that you can use to, to build what we call honey encryption. Uh, honey because, uh, well, we'll see why in a little bit. Okay, so there's these two approaches, and we're going to actually look at them in turn. Okay, so let's start with the first, password-based uh, crypto based on PKCS number five. This is a standard that's uh, the, the de facto standard for how we do password-based encryption practice. And it's really simple. We have a uh, password and assault, as I said, and we hash it a bunch of times, C times, a little bit C times. We generate a key, and then we use uh, a regular cryptographic uh, encryption scheme. In, in the uh, spec, they specify CBC mode, okay? Let's uh, think about this a little bit, a few things. So you pick a salt every time freshly, okay? So this actually acts like a, a random IV uh, or a randomizer. Uh, 
you then hash, you get a key. So actually, every time you encrypt, you're getting a new key, OK? Uh, and then you use that with uh, CBC mode without it, with it all zeros IV, in fact. OK, but this is OK, because we're using a new key <laughs> each time we encrypt. So this actually achieves, well, we'll see what it achieves in a minute. OK, uh, but let's think really quickly this folklore suggestion, right? So if we, if we uh, are encoding a, a message M, right, and say this is something like ASCII text, Right, that we're encoding. And uh, we use the, the default encoding of ASCII text uh, and then encrypt it with CBC mode. If we decrypt uh, with the wrong key and we look at the uh, resulting plain text, how do we tell whether it's the real message or a fake message? If it's ASCII. What's that? If it's ASCII. If it's valid ASCII, yeah. So, uh, of course, uh, when we decrypt uh, with the wrong password, we're going to get basically out of CBC mode kind of a random looking uh, plain text. And it's very, very unlikely to be valid ASCII encoding, right? Because ASCII encodings for, at least for human readable stuff, is, it's a subset of the, uh, the uh, eight, uh, subset of each byte is fixed to zeros. Okay? So this doesn't work for the folklore types ideas. Okay, so what we're relying on here is uh, slowing down, uh, well, relying on in lots of places, I should add. Uh, this is used all over the place. Uh, when zip up and on. Basically, anywhere that people do password-based encryption, you're probably using a variant of PKCS5, uh, probably PKCS5 itself. Uh, so what we're doing is we're relying on two mechanisms here to try and slow down brute force attacks. The first is the salt, and the second is the iteration count. Okay? So let's get some intuition, at least, for why attacks uh, are hard here. Okay? Uh, and in particular, what we expect is that if this hash function that we use is pretty good, let's just imagine that it's random, right? So every input output is, is mapped to some random output. What's the best thing an attacker can do? Uh, well, he enumerates all of his passwords that he wants to try in this dictionary, one, two, three, four, five, six, and all the others. And, uh, and he takes this salt that he gets from the ciphertext that he's trying to crack, and he has to re-derive all these keys. So what would happen if we have the output of this, you know, too small, something like 32 bits? What's that? 32, that's a good question, actually, if 2 to the 32 is faster than brute force cracking attacks. I would sh still try 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 first, uh, actually. But uh, yeah, that's a, good, that's a good point. So if it's too small, the key space is going to be, you could just brute force the key space. Any other issues that might arise? If you have uh, relatively small... Uh, uh, you have collisions in the middle. Yeah, collisions in the middle, which is um, uh, problematic in the sense that we're actually assuming that, that to actually get the benefit of these iterations, uh, we're, we're assuming that you don't have collisions in here, right? And uh, uh, one would need to actually prove this to show this. And we'll, we'll, we'll do that. But surprisingly, no one's actually had done this before we looked at it a few years ago. Tom, why isn't it the same analysis that Hellman did? That's a good question. Uh, Well, so Hellman didn't have a, a notion of security for encryption. He wasn't looking at encryption. He was he just looking at hashing. He looked at in, uh, intersecting chains by yeah. a random function. Yeah, so the, the mechanics of the combinatorics underlying our proof is, is presumably the same as his. I'd have to go look at it again. He also assumed a uh, uniform distribution over the Passwords. starting points. Uh, yeah. In your case, you have probability. Yeah, so it's a good, great point. Yeah, we're going to do something more general. In terms of the kind of thing. I'm kind of assuming for the purpose of the talk that it's uniform anyway, but it's definitely going to be more general. Uh, okay, so let's uh, let's you know start trying to formalize and get towards some 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 formal analysis of this. This is actually what we set out to do. Let's get a formal analysis of PKCS5 because we haven't seen a satisfying one. Uh, and so we can just recall now. We got me up here again, and uh, uh, let's look at kind of a variant of the CPA security for. Uh, for password-based crypto. So we'll let D be a set of possible passwords, and we just select one from the set of possible passwords. We uh, choose a random bit, and then we encrypt the message. Uh, this should be randomized. Encrypt the message under this password. Okay, and we get, you know, for simplicity, maybe let's just think about one uh, message, M0 and M1 pair. This is just like the IND CPA definition, okay? Um, That's where sort of should and try to find the password. You should try to find something that would that would return C. 
because he wants to enter your system. And, and, and your system does not. This is not a, this, uh, so, so okay, that's a good, uh, a good question. We're not doing a password hashing here, though the mechanisms are gonna be very similar. We're actually looking at password-based encryption. So you just broke into LastPass, okay, which is this provider of, uh, of uh, Vault services, okay? And what, what does LastPass have? It has an encryption of all of my other passwords under some master password, okay? So in this case, actually, there's like a list of like my Google password and my you know, Facebook password. Uh, all these are one, two, three, four, five, six, obviously for me, but whatever. So he, he uh, you know, they have this, uh, this plain text, which is all these passwords. It's encrypted under my master password, which is also one, two, three, four, five, six. But uh, anyway, and, and so you broke in, you have now access to the ciphertext, and you want to crack, uh, crack the ciphertext, okay? Uh, and then get the, the plain text from there and move on. What we uh, are modeling here is something even stronger that we want, you know, indistinguishability type security, right? So this is going to imply message recovery type security uh, if we can achieve it. And that's what we want to target. Okay, so, uh, so to cut the chase, we can use, uh, we can actually prove uh, security for this up to um, Q over uh, C times N showing that as long as, uh, um, as, long as collisions are, are small, so the, block, the output size of this hash function is small, and we model the hash functions a random oracle as something that gives you ideal behavior, we can actually prove the security of this construction uh, uh, up to this bound. Q is the number of like, hash computations that you do, and uh, C is that chaining, the, the size of these chains. So this is actually exactly what you'd expect um, that uh, you can do. Uh, so basically, every you have to do C times you know every, the amount of work that you'd have to do without the chaining. Okay, uh, and I'm not going to go into the details of the proof. The thing that I found was interesting about this is actually every we've talked about all this stuff, and, and nowhere has salting come up as an as an issue here, right? So actually, if, yeah. Because salting is just computational. And here, don't think computational is a factor. Not because of that, because of amortizing across getting many passwords. Yeah, this is, so uh, there's, there's a few things that salting is good for, and we'll look at that. But, uh, oh, sorry, this is a little random other thing, right? Of course, there's, there's an easy brute force attack. This is optimal, uh, this proof. But it doesn't say anything about, uh, uh, about salts. Uh, in particular, you can prove this even if you remove salts from the construction, right? Salts are good for the processing. Yeah. So why, why, are, why are we using salts? Well, in practice, we know why we're using salts, right? There's lots of, I mean, we're not, I'm not telling people anything new. There's, there's, there's two things that are really nice about salts. One is that, uh, uh, you know, it helps with preventing pre-processing. So if you pick a long salt, you can't use rainbow tables against, uh, in the cracking effort, right? Because if you have a salt of size, you know, 128 or something, uh, you can't build a rainbow table for every salt, and it doesn't work. That's great. The other thing, and the thing that really intrigued us, is that um, uh, we also want uh, that if you're trying to crack two people's passwords, so you broke into LastPass, right? And now you have like all of our passwords, or anyone who's using LastPass. We want that uh, cracking one guy's uh, 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 ciphertext and another person's ciphertext, as long as they have independent passwords, we want you to have to do two times the work, right? And salts provide that intuitively. Okay, but uh, what we realized is that the existing encryption model that we had been using, okay, we proved security already without salts, but uh, we know that uh, we want to prove something a bit stronger. So there's something, uh, there's something off here, right? People look confused, which is good, because it is confusing. Okay, and well, the reason is because we didn't have a rich enough uh, definition of security in terms of what is the attack setting that we're interested in. You're not just getting one user's ciphertext, you're getting lots of user's ciphertext. Now we want to look at this setting. So, so uh, great, so in terms of the best known attack, so we're in this multi-instance setting in the sense that we have lots of ciphertexts uh, of messages uh, encrypted under pa uh, different passwords, right, from different users, say. And uh, we know that, uh, you know, ignoring pre-computation versus, uh, 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 so this is just all computation. With salts, you know, you need about MCN, the best attack requires about M times C times N time. Okay, assuming these passwords are independent. And without salts, uh, there's a speed up, right? You can, you can build a table and, and, and do an attack that's better. Okay, so we knew this, this is nothing new, but uh, our theory didn't have a way to explain this issue, okay? 
So the question is, uh, you know, can we actually prove this? What type of model are we doing and can we prove it? So I'll go through uh, kind of just some intuition about why this is interesting. So <coughs> we had this uh, single instance security notion for INDCPA, right? But this wasn't sufficient to capture the role of multiple instances, and in particular to show that you need to, to do more work to, to decrypt or learn any information about uh, multiple messages encrypted under different passwords. So now we're going to try and build a definition that takes this into account and allows us to express that. So the first thing that comes to mind is uh, what uh, is, is referred to as multi-user encryption, maybe, that uh, you kind of extend the definition so that we have uh, two oracles, each using their own password. Okay, uh, and same challenge bit. Okay, that you encrypt one or two uh, of the other messages, right, under these different passwords. You give the adversary access to both these oracles. Okay, so and then we can define advantage in the normal way. So, is this going to allow us to show that we can uh, that you have to do n times the effort to break multiple encryptions? I see someone shaking their head. Why not? Isn't there a problem with choosing the same B for both uh, oracles? Yes. And why? Because then you can just guess that it's one. You have more than quarter probability of succeeding in both experiments. You wouldn't like to make it to have that. There's only one bit B, so... Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think maybe getting towards the intuition, which uh, I have. But, um, I mean, the problem is that once you crack one ciphertext here, you learn the bit. Right? The, once you recover PW1, you, you recover the bit. Right? All you have to do is make one query, get one ciphertext, and encrypt under password one, uh, crack that with, with C times N work, right? then you learn the bit, and you win the game. So how much work did it take C times N? That's not what we wanted to prove. We wanted to prove that it took two times C times N work here. Excuse me, two times C times N. So this isn't going to cut it as a definition of security. Okay. Uh, Oh, it doesn't work for us. I just said that. Okay. So in fact, what we need to do is, is actually make the games completely independent uh, in the sense that, or the Oracle, the challenge Oracle is completely independent. So we choose a different password. We actually choose a different bit. And then over here, we choose another independent bit. Okay. And so now you're an adversary interacting with different Oracles that, uh, are, uh, that he now needs to, uh, to, to try and crack. So if you get back C, you'll learn this bit. If you crack CD, you'll learn this bit, but not this one. Right? So partial information about the first message pair, but not the second message pair. Okay, but now we have something that's kind of weird here. You, you, we're used to just having one challenge bit, two different worlds, and now we have multiple challenge bits. It's confusing. How do we measure advantage? Right? Usually it's just one half plus negligible or, or subtracting things. So what, what are some natural options here? One quarter. One quarter, yeah. That's, that's the first idea, yeah, good. So you output both bits and you uh, do a measure of, of advantage where you subtract off the trivial probability of one quarter. You need to measure depending on how many queries it makes. If he makes no, less than the first threshold, then it should be a quarter. If he makes more than that, it should be... I mean, you want to you want to say that after you crack M passwords, he needs, or however many he said he needs to do that many, then you'd want to... Yeah, I, uh, that's... I don't, I don't know about that. I mean, you, you, you're, it's not clear that the work has anything to do with each individual oracle because you can be attacking the hash function. But, uh, yeah, I'm not sure I understand exactly your suggestion. Let me just keep going. Maybe it'll be clear. If not, we can... But as the adversary, I can just work hard, find one. Yeah. And then I have half probability to be successful that by guessing. Yeah. So half, it's a quarter, actually. So this is something that makes me not super happy with this measure, uh, just this advantage measure, uh, which is that uh, exactly this, right? You break one of them, and then you guess the other bit, and you get advantage one quarter, which is constant, not you know, something that's negative, but it's kind of annoying. A better way to do this, I think, and something that's more natural, is actually what you force the attacker to do is guess the XOR of these two bits. And uh, this, is, this is nice, because it uh, throws out this kind of trivial attack where you get constant advantage. Okay. This is uh, pretty, pretty far on the theory end of things uh, uh, for the, the practical guys in the room, but uh, it's very interesting that our definitions are really hard to work with when you actually want to prove this, this very practical thing, PKCS95. Okay? 
Yeah. If the password is the same for both users? Uh, so in, in our actual definitions, we do something more general, right? You have a distribution that outputs a vector of passwords, and then we look at the min entropy of the, the vector, like component-wise. So you could have some that are, um, the sum are that are related and some that are not, and we basically are able to model anything uh, on that nature, and you should get the optimal security. In terms of actual security, of course, if the passwords are dependent, then once you crack one, you, you get both, right? So you won't be able to do better. You won't be able to do that. You won't be able to get two times the amount of work if the passwords are dependent completely. No, the salts will not help you, right? Because if, the, if this password is selected and the entropy of this password is like one condition on the entropy of the other password. Yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. So in that case, you're not going to get much effort. So the only thing we can prove is when there's con like when this password condition on knowing this password is, is still unpredictable. Well, you need to do that uh, amount of work proportional to that unpredictability, right? Additionally, after you crack the first password, and that's what we're really looking for. This is a little bit of a simplification. This is independent. Great observation. Yeah. Yeah. This definition is not really pretty. I mean. No, no, it's not. <laughs> what about uh, trying to do something? I I mean, my slides are offended. I'm not, but well, the slides are offended. I, I get a real world kind of definition. Uh, choose all the messages, do the XR of the needs. Why is just making two words and why doesn't it work? I, I don't know. I mean, we tried really hard to come up with a way to express this, uh, this issue of how to actually measure the, the advantage uh, in a way that. Um, provides a reasonable measure, and we couldn't come up with anything better than this. It actually took us a while to come up with this, as ugly as it is. Um, so it seems fundamental that you're in this, this setting where you, it's, it's, uh, you have a setting where you have this parallel you know, access to all of these different uh, things. It's, you know, conceptually, it's quite closely related to hardness amplification results, like what we saw on the first day, right? So that if you're doing, um, uh, if you're doing uh, you know, multiple uh, uh, one-way functions, can you amplify the, the security from like constant to, to negligible, it's related to that kind of concept, but it's not it's not exactly the same. Okay, oh, go ahead. Yeah. If you have a scheme that uh, reveals uh, just completely reveals one and not the other, you can still you still have an advantage that's negligible with this definition. That's true. Yeah, yeah. The definition is somewhat. Yeah, so in the, in the actual definition, we actually also allow corruptions. It's still uglier yet, uh, which speaks to that a bit. Um, the scheme here is the same across all of these. So uh, note that if you have a scheme that's kind of flaky in that significant way, uh, if it's flaky for all passwords, then, you, then you're going to leak it for all ones, and that would be a problem. Um, uh, but uh, you know, I mean, it's easy to come up with examples of schemes that are going to be kind of broken on a particular password maybe or something, so there's issues there. Yeah, this is, this is a pretty deep topic actually. I don't, I don't think we're done with it, right? I think uh, maybe people could improve quite a bit on what we've done here, but it was our, our uh, best effort uh, at the time to come up with a definition that actually allows us to measure the security. And that's basically what this slide says. There's all sorts of other stuff going on here. Uh, you know, things get technically hard in this setting too, just for the theoreticians in the room. Um, if you want to do hybrid arguments, for example, we saw hybrid arguments in the first day. Hybrid arguments here get much harder because you have to, you actually end up losing a factor two to the end because there's all these games going around. All these games you have to deal with as, a fact, as close to a factor of you know, two or, or more generally however many hybrids you have to factor of that many to the uh, Interesting, Interesting, challenging stuff. So, um, okay, so what we can do is in, in this model then show uh, Still assuming H is a random oracle, we can sh show nice results. And in particular, that um, you know, mo uh, modulo some terms that will be small uh, relative, is assuming you're actually using you know, realistic passwords that have a small n, resident using small n. We can prove that uh, you get what you expect from this, that uh, the security degrades uh, proportionally to MCN, which is what we were looking for. And again, here Q is the number of uh, you know, hash computations you do. 
There's much more machinery involved in this analysis. I'm not going to go into it just to give you a flavor. The thing I think is really interesting is that you know our, our conventional security notions didn't allow us to, to represent this uh, this uh, this very fundamental kind of mechanism, salting. And I think, I think in, you know if you go look at real world systems, people have very good in intuition for why you do it. Salting, and when you look at it, yeah, we know why salting is good. But uh, the theory was had to play catch up a little bit. Thank you. Okay, so let's, uh, any quick questions on that before we go on? Okay, so uh, let's look at this other point of view, this folklore idea about how to make it hard to pick out the correct password. And why do we want to do this? Well, we have these nice proofs, right? But those proofs were only uh, proportional to uh, MCN, right? You know, if M is 1, if you only care about your password, then you're still, you know, you're still kind of toasted. Even if M is reasonably large, you care about a bunch of people's passwords, and it's, uh, Still potentially exhausting, right? Remember, one, two, three, four, five, six is, is pretty probable. Uh, so this is just some arithmetic that I calculated on my own to show that even if you pick reasonably good uniform passwords, this is still, you know, track Q equals two to forty-four, totally trackable nowadays. Just so we're clear, right? You can do this on, a, you know, on a system in a couple hours probably. So uh, yeah, so LastPass is still kind of hosed in this case, right? Even though we can prove these things, uh, we're still limited fundamentally by passwords. So we'd like other options. So let's get to this, this um, folklore one, right? Recall that uh, all these attacks require kind of detecting in the second phase uh, that you actually have the right message. And our, our IND CPA style notions uh, basically assume this is easy, right? Because they actually choose the messages. In practice, if you don't know the messages a priori, it's still easy for practical schemes because of the encodings used are, 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 uh, are loose. Even if the encodings were tight, uh, sometimes it's not clear you're going to have the right distribution of, of, of things over here, so it might still stick out. So what we really want is you know, some type of encryption that uh, provides these type of uh, uh, plain text when we do decryption under all these different uh, keys slash passwords. I'll let you decide which you think is the, uh, the correct, uh, <laughs> the correct uh, the plain text here. OK, so yeah, how do we go about doing this? Well, what we do is introduce this framework for trying to build schemes that if you know a good estimate of the distribution of messages that you expect to encrypt, then we can provide for you, uh, at least we show in some cases, and we think this will work more generally, uh, not in general purpose, but for a particular message, and you'd be able to come up with uh, solutions. That, uh, so if you have this uh, message distribution estimate, then we can build schemes such that when you decrypt uh, with the wrong password, you get back uh, a, a plain text that is distributed, looks like syntactically, and is distributed according to, the, to your estimate, right? So if you get a good estimate of the, the distribution of real messages, then you're going to be good, uh, and it's going to be hard to pick out the, the right value. If you have a bad estimate of this message, well, we'll get security in the conventional sense, at least, so we haven't made things harder, or, uh, easier, excuse me, uh, on the uh, attacker. Can you use the fault-preserving uh, technique in order to encrypt only the, uh, uh, the possible messages into uh, yeah. the same set of things? Fantastic. So, uh, so the suggestion on the table is, can we just use format-preserving encryption? Yeah, that's good. So in some cases, we, we, we can, actually. Well, one thing, we don't necessarily have the format-preserving restriction, so we might want to do a, a bit more than just format-preserving. But at least intuitively, you think of ranking and unranking as giving us something that we might want here. Right? So what distributions of messages is this going to be good for? Uniform, uniform over the set, right? So if you have a, a uniform number that's in a sparse space, like something like a credit card number that's uniform, then um, you can use a, a format preserving encryption and actually uh, uh, ranking to deal with this. You have to be very careful with your uh, uh, particular CV. If you're using CBC mode, you have to be careful to make sure there's no padding. And we're, we're going to build a framework that actually allows us to do this, but do it more generally for non-uniform distributions as well, which uh, uh, format preserving encryption doesn't handle. Yeah. But format preserving limited the length of my password. Uh, that's true, and uh, length here is not something we deal with uh, directly, but you can you can pad, uh, of course, to deal with length if you want to. And in this context, you might want to do that because uh, it's not going to cost much if you're doing storage of passwords online or something. Great. Yeah. Say again. Is, is it used in the real world? No, we, we introduced this like a few months ago. 
So, no. <laughs> but we're working on it. Uh, and it's not clear yet whether it will be useful or not, to be perfectly honest. Uh, this is the real world. There is a real world uh, application, and it's called the Rabbelhole script analysis. And uh, this is when you are coming with your laptop through a border crossing. Yeah. It's fully encrypted, yeah. and you are forced to the yeah. So, so, so rubber hose script analysis is a whole different context that we should probably not get into because people are going to get hurt and I was told not to hurt anyone. <laughs> Let me clarify. I think there's there's clear, obvious applications for this. Like LastPass is a great uh, potential use. Yeah, I'm sure there's, there are great applications. Yeah, and I don't know if we're going to realize those potential applications yet or not. That's the short answer. Yeah. But can you deal with the fact that if you're usually choosing a password uh, human is choosing, then you have the distribution of the language, the dictionary, all that stuff. The fact that it would be ASCII or any other yeah. form of preserve this may be easy, but how you deal with all the distribution, especially dictionary and things like that? That's a great question. Uh, stay tuned in a few months. Hopefully, we have an answer for you, I guess. But let's dig into it a little more, and, and, and we can we can go from there. And we'll do basically some special cases that are. Not necessarily even non-uniform distributions, but uh, interesting and challenging ones to deal with. Okay, uh, and this gives us some confidence, some evidence that this uh, that we can actually do what, what I'm, I'm suggesting more generally. So, in particular, let's look at uh, building a, a Honey encryption scheme for prime members. So, I have like half an RSA key, right? Uh, prime P, and I want to uh, encrypt that under my password. Why well, might uh, or sorry? If you have half of uh, RSA prime, you can always generate the other one. Uh, given, so, no, no, forget everything I just said. Boy, it's getting late in the day. <laughs> I'm violating some great number theory. So, uh, <laughs> we're going to, for simplicity, look at just encrypting a, a single prime. The same technique will work for both primes um, uh, with some uh, embellishments, okay? So, our, our task here is to, to encrypt a, a prime number. The application setting actually is, is, is practical. In fact, after we, we were working on this, we found some related work from 1999 where there was a system where they, they actually did what we call honey encryption. It was really, it was really clever. They, they, they generated RSA secrets in a special way to make sure that they can encode the, the prime as uh, just an integer, um, and, and, or the secret, excuse me, for their system, which was not a prime anymore, but just was a secret as the exponent. They encrypted uh, that using a conventional scheme without any padding. Uh, and then what they did is, you would, uh, in usage, you would basically encrypt your um, secret, which is actually an integer, not a prime number, uh, locally with your PIN number, you'd encrypt it, and you'd store the public uh, portion of this asymmetric scheme at a remote site only, okay? And then the idea is if someone breaks into my server, the client computer, he has to crack this uh, outer encryption, and he's just going to get back a bunch of random numbers, and he's still going to have to go and log into the remote server on each of those. So it's turning an offline brute force attack into an online brute force attack. And this is fantastic. So they, they, they did this. They don't have any formal framework for it. Uh, but it was a very, very clever idea. Uh, and I think it turned, it turned into a company that got bought out and stuff. And whatever. I guess they're gone by now. Uh, Arcot Systems, for those of you who know industry history. Anyway, so we wanted, they only were able to do it for, they, work, they built a really special system to work around the fact they didn't know how to do honey encryption for prime numbers, essentially, to put it in my terms. So we're going to try and solve that for them. <coughs> OK, and so to motivate a little bit, what happens if we take a, a, a regular password-based encryption uh, and then encode our prime just as, in the normal way? right? Well, when you do de uh, decryption uh, and uh, do a brute force attack, you get back a bunch of numbers. right? OK, and what's the next step that you'll do? Take the yeah, you check primality of these numbers. right? So which one of these is prime? You get, <laughs> 16 is <laughs> that's a, that's my type of answer here. 16, definitely prime. Uh, <laughs> right, uh, 9883 is actually a prime number. I, I looked it up online. I figured out myself. Um, okay, here you assume that n, the public key, is not available to the attacker. That's exactly right. Yep, yep. So you can't have uh, side information about the prime number. And in the in the system application, that was exactly explicit. You had to only store this this eight other part on the remote server. But the cool thing about it is you get compromised resilience on both sides, one from the honey encryption and one from just having the public secret, or the public part of the secret, yeah. But if you leave it here, like this wouldn't be useful for TLS uh, secrets, right? Because the public key is known in public. Okay, but this is our great you know, example of, of doing honey encryption. So, okay, so now with honey encryption, what do we want to do? We want to have it so that when you decrypt this, this particular ciphertext with all these different keys, you get back prime numbers, right? 
Uh, and so, uh, how do we do that? Well, our approach is, is uh, the following. We're going to do a special type of encoding, as you might expect, uh, on, our, on our number. And uh, in particular, uh, and I call this a distribution transforming encoder. Here we're not really transforming distribution. We're just getting it into the right format. But more generally, we might have totally non-standard distribution over here, something normal or some histogram or something. And, uh, and then we want this to take our prime p and uh, encode it as a bit string that ends up, in this case, looking like a uniform bit string because we have a uniform prime number. So we get a very dense encoding of it as a uniform bit string. Then we encrypt using a conventional password-based encryption scheme like PKCS number five, okay, uh, under our password and to get a ciphertext C. Now what we want from this distribution transforming encoder is that when the adversary gets this ciphertext and goes backwards uh, intuitively through, a, through, the encrypt, uh, through the decryption process with K prime, well, for appropriate, uh, uh, you know, for things like PKCS number five encryption, you're going to get back something that essentially looks like a uniform bit string. Now, in, in, from a theoretic, theoretic, theoretician's point of view, you can think this is only true in idealized models, like random oracle model or something. But uh, uh, nevertheless, it, it, in practice, it seems totally fine. So you get back something that looks like a fresh uniform bit string. And now what are we going to do? Roll it back to the distribution transform. Yeah, you go backward through the decoder, and what should the decoder be doing? Yeah. Right, and so what, what, it, what is the decoder actually doing at this point? It's a, it's a prime number sampling algorithm, right? So you, you're going to actually have a decoder that essentially takes this bit string and now treats this as like random coins and uses that to choose a fresh prime number. Okay? And uh, good. So, okay, that's going to be a little slow, obviously, but uh, you know, maybe we don't care because this is... Uh, this is last pass. It's not uh, on the critical path on the wire or something. So this is the uh, the high level idea. Um, we, we in the in the work we give some particular constructions of doing this for particularly distributed primes. It's kind of interesting because if you pick primes via rejection sampling, uh, you have uniform primes. Uh, and actually, the, the best solution we have right now, and I think there's probably low hanging fruit in terms of improving it, is that we actually have to encode a, a bunch of candidate. Um, integers here. So actually we have some ciphertext stretch that's uh, kind of unfortunate. Um, but uh, if you choose primes via other mechanisms, like the uh, choose a random integer and then increment until you find a prime, which is used in a bunch of systems, then we can do an optimal kind of the compact encoding where this is very uh, efficient. Why do you bother encoding at all? Just take the randomness that you use originally to generate the prime. Take the randomness. Ah, oh, good. So if we can hook into the uh, uh, regional key generation functionality, we could do that. Uh, we want to have a scheme that you can generate your primes with some other system, like OpenSSL keygen, and uh, later get uh, the, the prime number and go from there. So that's a good point. In some cases, you might be able to do something simple. So this is cool. This is one application, and one example. This is, doesn't get us to the last pass type of situation. We're actually what we want to do is, is passwords here. And that's much more complicated, as was pointed out, because what we need is a, an, a, a way to do encoding that yeah, encoding into a dense space here, such that when you decode it, you get back a bunch of plausible looking passwords. There's a small problem with the idea of uh, looking for the first prime in the sequence starting from the starting point because it's not uniform distribution over yep. the primes. That's absolutely true. And then uh, uh, and, and the reason, just for everyone else, uh, is, uh, uh, keeping up with Ari, <laughs> which is usually me, um, but I thought about this a lot before I make this slide, uh, is that uh, you know, if you think about twin primes, this prime, uh, this random selection and then increment, you're never going to hit the, the, the twin, right, with very, or, except with exceedingly negligible probability. So yeah, you don't actually get uniform primes with that other algorithm, so it doesn't work with the slide. Um, you get slightly different algorithm, but the, uh, if you invert this in our decoder, we get exactly the same distribution back. And that's important. So we actually have a non-uniform distribution of the primes, and our decoder is going to give us back that same exact distribution. Okay? And so these statistically won't be distinguishable. Oh boy. Uh, okay, so good. So that's the basic idea. This is one example. This is primes, right? And all of these schemes are going to be specific to the message distribution that you're targeting. So you do need to know something about the message distribution. The cool thing is that we can then uh, uh, prove, uh, it, for this particular case, uh, you know, basically optimal security, right? For message recovery security. What does roughly stand for? Roughly? 
Mm -hmm. Oh, roughly is uh, uh, informal for saying this is what the, the theorem approximately looks like. This is an informal statement. I should say informal. I guess that's the technically correct thing to say. What the theorem really says? Uh, so there's, a, there's some uh, low order terms related to the representation error and some, some other overhead in the proof. But uh, those will be negligible. So they'll be, they'll be very, very small. Uh, and we do concrete security, but, but you can make them ar arbitrarily small. If you think about like the, if you think about the encoder I mentioned where you actually are, are you have a sequence of candidate uh, integers in the decoding process, we, you know, we have to cut that off at some point and there's always a probability of failure if you don't have enough, right? Because you may not have a prime. So there is some error in the, D, the DT's approximation, but it's negligible. We can make it negligible by making it large. Okay, good, so, so the, uh, the high order term is essentially what this roughly means is, is uh, security of, of if the, the bound here is dominated by one over Q, where Q is the uncertainty about the password, right? Is this tight? Yeah, of course, right? Because there's a trivial attack. You just guess the most likely password and then decrypt and then output whatever you got for message recovery security. Okay, so this doesn't achieve, we're not looking at IDCPA, but we're really looking at message recovery here. But what we can do is uh, provide these type of very strong uh, bounds. Uh, and I'm not going to get into it, but the proofs kind of use some interesting uh, you know, combinatorial balls and bins types of analysis here. I think you know, we'll talk about, talk about them later. Okay, so that's like where we're at. You know, we have, there's a framework for dealing with this with distribution transform encoders. The ch challenge now is getting uh, um, DTEs for, for message types of interest. You know, the prime one has this nice, this nice but narrow application. There's some other places where we'd like to do it. Credit card numbers, we can do it with FP. If you want to do credit card number plus, say, the PIN that you use with your credit card number, you now have a non-uniform distribution, right? Because what's the most popular PIN? Uh, I think you guys are wrong. It's 1111. <laughs> so, <laughs> in Israel, you don't get to choose. It's always 1234? No, no, no. <laughs> it's good to know. So, uh, if that's non, not non uniform, we handle that case uh, with some estimates, and it's not, it's not hard. Uh, and you can, yeah, and there's some more details in, in the paper. We just posted it actually last night. Um, and of course, the thing we're working on right now is, is building password based ones. And we have some ideas about actually taking password crackers to use as encoders, or decoders rather. Uh, because password crackers have really good estimates of, uh, state of the art password crackers have really good estimates of, uh, of password distributions, right? Because they're ordering things based on popularity. So, anyway, we're, we're working on this. Okay, uh, good. So, that's actually the first part, which took uh, a while. <laughs> that's okay. Any questions? Yeah, please ask questions. We can always skip some of the, the last part uh, from around time. Okay, so um, I know this from the forensics people. And yeah. In part with brute force, well, they generally don't. Mm -hmm. Most are based on course, what, what you, you are analyzing here is um, a, a, a random password of a random person. So, what happens in practice, they profile a person in terms mm -hmm. of his name, mm -hmm. his full name, name, his pet's name, psychological profile. So, how many, so how many passwords are you going to try? Um, I have no idea how many they generally try. So but even I if it's a psychological profile, yeah. which takes a yeah, year. Uh, so, so I think that, yeah, so that's absolutely right. So in practice, you might have side information about the, the, the password, and that's going to reduce this, this denominator here, right? So if you have even just two options for the password, well, you have, now you get two things back, two prime numbers. Which one is it? I don't know. You may have, you have to go find other side information to confirm. Right, and that's the best we're going to be able to do here, of course, is, is push it to find side information elsewhere about the message. The forensic guys are looking for several passwords chosen by the same guy, yeah. and uh, then they find a pattern. Yes. They also have changes uh, digit or something. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that's a challenge. Actually, that, so, so, sorry, you said for different passwords you have. Uh, Some of them have uh, my banking password, yeah, and yeah. they also have password for New York Times yeah. and others, yeah. which are easier to get. Totally, and there's been some nice quantifications. This is actually, actually one of the big challenges we're facing right now as we're trying to build a LastPass type thing because. Uh, I guess this is being recorded, we should be revealing all our secrets. But uh, obviously people in their password vaults are going to have rep repetitions of their passwords or modification stuff. And this is actually not as well understood as, as uh, basic password distribution. Anyway. Then, then another thing is the yep. PKC is five type of scenario. Yep. Often the actual key is generated randomly and the password encrypts the key. 
and the mm -hmm. system will give you a way to check that you correctly decrypted the password. Um, oh, sorry, that you correctly decrypted the key before you start decrypting. The Perfect. scheme you're showing here, if it was a very large file I'm decrypting, that's going to take 10 minutes to decrypt, and after 10 minutes I find out that I do not understand the content of my file, <laughs> because there's no uh, check from so, the password to... So you raised two, two, uh, two interesting points. One is that... Uh, so first off, PKCS5 doesn't, I think, allow that if you have a strict reading of the standard. Oh, okay. But uh, that's fine. There's variants of PKCS5 uh, in which you do have this uh, redundancy check, right? Uh, you use a chem dent type thing. Uh, so that actually makes the brute force attacks even easier against PKCS5 because you can just reject right away. Two, you bring up the issue of what happens when I type my password in wrong and I decrypt the Pony encryption. I get back something that, if we did a good job, looks, looks uh, like my legitimate uh, message, right? Uh, maybe I know that it's not the legitimate message. If it's a prime number, of course I don't know. So in some contexts, this isn't necessarily a big deal. If I'm logging in remotely, it'll just register uh, as uh, an incorrect login, right? If it's a prime number for this RCOT type system. And then I hopefully don't do as many uh, typos as uh, an attacker would do for brute forces. The other issue is maybe we can deal with that with a little bit of, of work, and we're, we're thinking about this now. But it's a great, a great practical concern that we still haven't totally sorted. Yeah. Other questions or comments? Okay, so uh, good. So let's we're going to move on to the. So we were, we started down here. We're going to move up here just to keep everything everyone guessing and look at uh, uh, this format transforming encryption stuff. So <clears throat> now we're moving to a totally different context, right? We're not doing passwords anymore. We're uh, we're thinking about internet connectivity, and in particular, we're worried about uh, situations in which someone is sitting on the on the network and looking at our communications as they go across the network and trying to censor these. And in particular, uh, what often is going on is uh, particular protocols are being detected and uh, shut down by these uh, network sensors. Okay. Uh, you know some examples of, of such uh, systems out there? Or tries to hide his SSL, but people want to, to prevent from using SSL at all. Yeah, but that wasn't the question I asked, but a great answer for a different question. Uh, the question is, where are some contexts in which, uh, in which this goes on? Right. Say again? All over the world. All over the world, yeah, that, pretty much. If an ISP segment, they want to clamp down, they want to, not necessarily protocol, but they want to set up video yeah. bandwidth and so forth. Yeah, so an ISP is to you know, detect BitTorrent and, and yeah. throttle, yeah. Th throttle, absolutely. Uh, the, our motivate, what's that? Corporate firewall, yeah, could be. Uh, our motivating application was uh, was China and, and, and Iran, actually, that uh, they're doing this to shut down everything, like TLS connections, uh, there's, well, a little imprecise there. So uh, in Iran, for example, they did shut down like, all the TLS connections for a while, or at least start throttling them when they detected. So this goes on, and we're interested in this uh, 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 situation. Uh, and in particular, you know, we have this DPI system that wants to identify some protocol that it's, you know, that it's packets of which it sees on the network. And if it's TLS or Tor, then they want to throttle or shut down the connection. Uh, you know, if it's something that they can, or something else, like HTTP, then maybe they leave it alone. Uh, and if it's, you know, unidentified, then in some cases, with uh, strict uh, situations, they really will just throttle this traffic as well, uh, because they don't understand what it is. Uh, that's rare, but it does happen in these countries. Okay, so, how do they do this? How do DPI systems work? So DPI is deep pack inspection, right? And they're looking at now application layer protocols. These aren't IP or TCP, but uh, looking at the application layer. Uh, and if you recall back um, lectures by Kenny on, on the TLS, like kind of wire format, right, for the record layer, you know, one of the first things that gets sent is a description of, um, well, a description of like the fact that I'm TLS, basically. This is a TLS connection. I, I, you basically announce it on the packet. And so this is a regular expression now that uh, is, is looking for you know, this, the magic string. It's not actually RTLS 1.1, that's a, okay, that's a translation or something. Okay, so they do it using regular expressions in, uh, in general, it seems, and, and I'll back this up with some uh, investigation of particular uh, DPI systems in a moment. Okay, so that's our problem, right? Conventional encryption uh, protocols really don't try to hide their presence. 
right? Uh, and uh, you have these systems that are like looking for you know TLS, or they're also looking for HTTP. Uh, you know, if they find HTTP, then they let it go. If they look, they find TLS uh, headers, then they they shut it down. And so, what can we do about this? Oh, this is just these are some cute uh, graphs actually uh, for those of you interested in censorship online. This is from the Tor project. So. Uh, this was uh, in January 2011, um, and uh, this is the number of Tor connections coming out of Iran uh, at the, the time, of, uh, well, over this period of time. And you see this huge uh, decline. Does anyone know what they did here in this particular case? <laughs> uh, I don't, so there's evidence on this chart that they did not execute everybody. It's over here. Uh, so no, they did not. Uh, did not the red? So, so the red is uh, sorry. The red just means that there is some big drop. It's like the, the first derivative of the, of the graph. So what they actually realized is that they could distinguish. Uh, I think in this case they they were particularly able to distinguish. So Tor uses TLS, okay, and they are able to distinguish Tor connections from regular TLS connections. And the way they were doing that is by looking at the certificate expiration dates in the certificates being used in the backward direction, okay. which was very short, right? So uh, Tor did the, the security conscious thing of having certificates that have a short expiration, like a year, okay? And what do most uh, web servers out there do with their expiration dates? Somewhere 20 to... Yeah, 20 to 30 years. And why do they do that? <laughs> Why not, right? I don't want my certificate to expire. It's like a pain. I have to go like get a new one. Uh, so, so yeah. So sorry. I mean, there might be other operational reasons. I'm being a little bit facetious, obviously. So no, no demeaning is intended. But uh, anyway, the point is that you can distinguish between uh, the Tor certificates and uh, normal certificates, and they're able to flag on that with their DPI systems and shut down these connections. Uh, Tor has rolled out a patch basically to choose new certificates that were uh, with smaller expiration dates. And there's been this cat and mouse game a little bit. Later on, there's another chart that shows that they just started throttling all of the TLS connections. And uh, this really hindered Tor performance to the point where Tor connections weren't getting through, even though regular TLS connections do. So anyway, there's been this big cat and mouse game enabled by the DPI system. So what can we do about this? There's been a bunch of approaches like uh, for doing a staking on graphic, like heavyweight staking graphic, stuff I would consider heavyweight staking graphic. There's kind of this old, whole literature about you know, embedding encrypted communications in you know, plausible looking traffic. So uh, you know, basically taking, like, say, something that looks like an HTTP message and embedding bits here and there uh, and hoping that it doesn't get detected. This totally works uh, against these filters, but it's really slow. Uh, so like, we can go back to having a 56K modem. I don't, I don't think Tor would actually work over this. Um, there's the other option of, of actually just, with, if you have a shared key ahead of time, you can just encrypt all the traffic, every single bit of traffic that comes across, uh, is being sent on the wire. And this is in fact what the immediate countermeasure that the Tor guys did uh, called OBS proxy. Um, and so this is fast, uh, but it's definitely going to cause DPI to, to tra fly traffic is kind of unknown, right? Because there's no headers whatsoever in this traffic. Um, and that may not be good enough in situations where you have strict, uh, strict uh, DPI uh, regimes. Okay, so what, what we wanted to do, what we thought was interesting here was trying to change the encryption such that we can force what we think of as misclassification attacks. So we don't want it just to get flagged as question mark, but we want to be able to trick the DPI easily and efficiently into marking the traffic as uh, uh, a protocol of our choosing. Okay, and really, really get the, uh, the DPI uh, confused and, you know, say, get the traffic whitelisted as HTTP. Okay, so to do so, we started by actually looking at some uh, uh, actual DPI systems or systems that get used as DPI. Bro is not primarily thought of as a DPI system, but it does use DPAC inspection. It can be used for these types of purposes. Uh, we also got access uh, nicely to a proprietary uh, box that's that kind of state of the art at the, 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 at the end of, um, well, in the moderately priced range, around you know, tens to twenties of thousands of dollars. Uh, we weren't able to release the name of the company they didn't want us to, so, okay. Um, so anyway, uh, what, what do these guys use? They do use regular expressions quite a bit, um, explicitly in uh, their uh, uh, scanning engines for looking at packet headers on the wire. 
Some of them don't. They, they don't. They just use C, C++ kind of coding. Uh, but some actually use explicit regex. So they have an engine that takes a regex and compiles it down to a, uh, an NFA, actually, and then uh, uses that to, uh, to match the standard Isn't techniques. Is there a characteristic distribution of uh, packet length for each one of the protocols? Yeah, there absolutely is. This is not made available. So nope, no one uses that. <laughs> nope. It's too, it, doesn't, it wouldn't work, I don't think. I mean, I don't know. I'm not an expert on DPI uh, beyond what we've done here. I'm not even, maybe that's not even, that's a stretch. But um, uh, yeah, these type of statistical attacks are, are very hard, I think, in practice because there's a lot of noisy stuff out there on the inter internet. And uh, what they've been doing for the most part, as far as we can tell, is you, know, you do the traditional things. You look at port number. The port number is easy to, to spoof. You just change the port number. And so now they're all looking at, at you know, these type of fast matching algorithms. And if you're working at a squire speed, you have to do with you know, 100 megabits, 10, 10 gigabits of traffic uh, uh, a second, then you need something that's really fast. And statistical things can be fast, but they're, they're noisy. And false positives can be painful. I think the main problem is that you have to wait uh, until several packets have gone through yeah. unless you want to store them. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I, yeah, I think the you know networking community has been working on this stuff for a long time, uh, and it, it seems like a really hard stuff to do in practice. Let, let's keep going. We'll, we'll see what what these guys are able to do and what we're able to do against them. So, okay, so we we, uh, we have uh, that they're using regexes, right, for doing pattern matching on traffic packets. So what does that uh, what does that remind us of from earlier today? Format preserving encryption. In which part of format preserving encryption? Say again? Yeah, okay, fine. I'm, I'm giving you easy questions that keep everybody away. So we want to build encryption schemes that, you know, basically fool these. And we're going to use the techniques narrated from FP, right? So what do we do? Well, conventional encryption, if we uh, encrypt everything on the wire, like we said, with ops proxy, we'll just get something that definitely doesn't look like, you know, say, what we want the DPI to uh, classify as, like HTTP. Um, but uh, so what are we going to do? We're going to change the interface a little bit, much like we did with FP, uh, and do uh, input not just a key, but also, in this case, a regular expression R, defining the, the format that we want the ciphertext to, to look like. Okay? And so we're guaranteed that the ciphertext, what we want from the encryption is guaranteed the ciphertext is actually going to match against this regular expression. Okay? So how do we do that? Well, it's, it's actually pretty easy once we have the uh, uh, tools uh, for doing unranking. We actually don't care about doing ranking here because uh, we don't care about length preservation. In fact, we can use a, a strong authenticated encryption scheme here. So we're just using the potential for doing this embedding of random bit strings, which come out of the encryption, into this language. Right. I want to understand the setup. The government, if you run by one of those DPI yeah. machines, and they, they will come with a fixed known uh, regex, or uh, the government, if you run, can change it, and it will not be known to whoever types of people? Uh, so, we, like, for example, with that proprietary one, uh, we don't know what regex they have in it. The others. Yeah. yeah. And so, all the others sell a device yeah. with a single uh, regex, which mm -hmm. will not be changed by the customer. No, the customer can definitely change regex. Why do they use regexes? Because they're easy to program. Mm -hmm. And that's actually what we're going to want to take advantage of on our so side as well. Do you know what uh, regex uh, the government of Iran is using no. or not? Uh, no, I don't. I don't assume that. So, yeah. so you have here a source regex and a destination regex? Like you... On either side of the connection, you mean for the client and server? Yeah, yeah. Transform TLS uh, messages into Shakespeare sonnets or something? Uh, I think I have a, a chart. Yeah. So here's the answer to that question. So how are we gonna how are we gonna use this? Well, you're gonna have regexes for one direction, different regex for the other. So if you want to have HTTP, for example, you'll use a regex that describes an HTTP GET message, mm -hmm. right? Or what we think that DPI is 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 looking for in terms of what they think a DPI regex uh, DPI uh, what an HTTP packet would look like, and then we'd have something for like an HTTP response, right? So it's getting a little ahead of myself. Okay, but just to reiterate, like what's going on here? We're, we're taking the ranking. We're using the unranking to embed ourselves in this language, and uh, of course we could do lots of other things. We could just kind of do ad hoc things for for every uh, every format you know target we have. We could just throw in you know a description of what we think an HTTP thing looks like. But what we really liked about this approach is again this programming interface that for the users of of this system they can sp specify a regex and just throw it at the system and it'll work. 
modulate a few caveats. If the regexes are too complicated, of course, there's some problems. But for the ones that we needed to use, we actually got it to work very efficiently. That efficiency thing actually comes up in this other part of the slide, right? If you have a reg XR to get down to these DFAs that we were using uh, for uh, ranking uh, via the Goldberg Sipser type algorithms, well, we have to go through a transformation, the standard like uh, Sipser type transformation, right? That uh, go from R to an NFA and then from an NFA to a DFA. But we know, you know, this has an exponential worst case blow up, and there's easy reg Xs that actually cause this worst case blow up. But uh, for the uh, ones that we're interested in here, we don't have those. Why? Because they want to check. Yeah, because they're using similar types of regexes, right? And they may not be exactly the same, but they need something of similar complexity, otherwise they have blow up. And can't they create regex using machine learning? <coughs> they, they see how, uh, how clients that they suspect using for... Uh, uh, yeah, they could, they could try that. And we actually do that a little bit ourselves, at least very simple ways of learning regexes from traffic. They don't do that in practice right now, but uh, and it's unclear if that actually works at scale. So we're the, one of the things I think that we're going to end up exploiting long term, just to wax poetic here for a second, is that my sense is that um, you know there's an asymmetry here in terms of like we can we, you know we can set up a regex and, and, and go with it. They have to look at all of this traffic, right? And um, traffic on the internet's really noisy. Like the you know implementations don't abide by standards. You know there's all sorts of weird problems with uh, uh, stuff that they have to look at. And we're going to be able to, you know, our regexes don't need to deal with that type of stuff. We just need to make sure that we match against what they're looking at. What they're looking at isn't going to be too complicated. They're not going to use machine learning or statistical stuff because it's just too hard to deploy in a way that's actually useful. That's a hypothesis. We'll see. We'll see. I don't understand the second. Like, they, they can connect to Tor and see what exactly the, the regex that you're using inside the public, right? I mean, yeah, absolutely. So, good. Why, so, so they can tune their machines. So yeah, good. So, uh, machine learning is up there, right? Like, so right, so so if they, we'll, we'll publish our regexes and uh, uh, and they can use those. In fact, we're actually going to use just some of the regexes already used by Bro. Okay, so they can use those regexes, but those regexes are what they're doing to look for HTTP in the first place. So if you start blacklisting that, what else are you going to blacklist? Regular HTTP connections, right? And so it becomes this uh, this this. You know, they're going to look for a regex that captures, you know, our traffic, but not regular HTTP traffic. But the regexes are very simple that these things use. It's like, you know, HTTP, you know, space, star, dot star, which is like anything. Uh, you know, then the, the other header packets, maybe, if, if you're lucky in terms of detail. And so it's very, uh, very permissive um, because it has to be fast and because there's a lot of weird stuff out there. And that and is your traffic look like the most popular site in yeah, 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 you can play with it. Yeah, and that's, and again, that's one of the things. You know, obviously, you know, we may get the regexes wrong in the first run, or they might be able to figure out something. But by having this programming interface, then it's easy for the tour guys to deploy a new regex, right? Like a signature that they can, like, roll out more easily without having to kind of come up with a whole other encoding mechanism. Okay, so that was kind of the high level theory view in actual practice making a record layer that uh, works. You know, uh, in an efficient way, doing all this stuff, encrypting and then rank unranking, you know, require quite a bit of work. There's a lot of engineering involved. The student, uh, Kevin Dyer, who uh, implemented this, has done just an amazing amount of work uh, trying to make sure this actually is fast and works. As far as we're aware, these are the first implementations of the Goldberg Sipser algorithm ever. Uh, and it took a lot of time to actually optimize them. There's some tweaks that we did uh, uh, to, get, to get it working quickly. Okay. So, um, good. So now we're, uh, we're at this place where we have FTE. We can choose regexes and, and throw it at our, our, our clients. How do we pick them? Well, there's a bunch of ways, right? And we kind of eva we evaluated a bunch of these. Um, one is to you know, easily just manually craft them ourselves. You can specify a regex that you think it, it describes HTTP, looking at the RFC or something. You know, I think the most hilarious one is actually just taking the regexes directly out of the source code of the open source DPIs and sticking it in this, because then you're guaranteed that this is what they're looking at. You can also start doing things like just trying to learn them from traffic samples. You know, it's easy to, to have kind of ad hoc algorithms for learning regexes from traffic samples. There's actually a rich literature there. We, we just played around with one simple solution. OK? And so we looked at uh, building a, a variety of cover protocols, HTTP, SSH, SMB, SIP, RTSP. It's like really easy to start specifying once you have the framework in. 
So not only are we going to be able to do this for HTTP, but we'll also be able to pretend to be many other protocols. And how do we do that? All we have to do is change the regex, right? Yeah. So, so one, so you're asking the question, why can't you just take a, a bunch of HTTP messages that you've already found, and then encode bits, uh, the ciphertext into various places inside of these HTTP messages? Yeah, so that's like what Stegatoris does, uh, for example, and they got pretty poor performance because they picked very narrow places to stick the bits. Um, you, could, you could get more performance by like making it more random. Uh, and in some sense, conceptually, I guess that's what the regex does for you, kind of automatically, that you know, once you, spec you, you specify the regex, that specifies some hard places that have to match certain things, and everywhere else it gets to be random. And that's actually kind of, in this, in this sense, the FT approach is, is kind of a minimalist approach, right? We want to uh, be able to uh, send as much random looking data subject to matching against this target regex as possible. So yeah, there's other ways you could do that type of encoding, but the thing that's convenient about the regex is that you get this API interface that's easy to use. And, and that's the win, you know, from a theory perspective, it's, yeah, you can do lots of things here perhaps, but from the practical perspective, we think this is very useful. Good. Uh, okay, so yeah, we can try lots of things. So we evaluated this, uh, you know, kind of in the following way, where we we set up a, a client and a server. We took uh, packet captures of everything, uh, ran, um, uh, sorry, we, we ran it by the, uh, the TPI system of, uh, that we're looking at for each of these ones, and we just, you know, we surfed the web basically over this. So this is some type of mix of HTTPS and HTTP as the target, as the source protocol. Uh, and then we set the regular expression, the target rate expressions to things like HPS, SH, and SMB. And the question is like, how often do we, how often does the DPI output, yes, this is HTTP, or yes, this is SSH, or yes, this is SMB. And here's the qualitative uh, uh, answer for these various classes of, of regexes. So for uh, these simpler ones that we, uh, so the DPI derived regex, basically we took, uh, actually what we did, this, for, this is particularly reflecting taking the regex is uh, for, say, HTTP from all of the uh, open source ones and then intersecting them all uh, using the regular intersection operator for regexes so that we are guaranteed to match uh, all of their regexes at the same time and, uh, and then evaluated. So what, this gave, and so what this gave us is against the ones that actually just use regexes, uh, we, al we always tricked uh, the device. So they sent every single connection was, was what we targeted. Bro was a little bit more complicated. There's like some corner cases that got missed by these regexes um, that were, were very easy to fix uh, by just tweaking the regex uh, manually. And probe actually doesn't use regexes, so uh, maybe it was unsurprising that we didn't fool them there. Uh, and the proprietary guy, well, I'll talk about him in a second. So, so in probe, so it's just a custom C++ engine. Uh, they don't have any explicit regexes in it. I mean, they're doing regular like checks, but uh, there's no easy compact representation of those to pull out of the source code. Um, so, uh, so we were missing some corner case, uh, some flag or some header uh, in, the, in the formats. Um, so we also looked at manual regexes, which are just, you know, the, Kevin basically sat down and programmed some regex. He said it took like 15 minutes per, per protocol once he had the, the routine down. Uh, and that was very easy to make these always work. Uh, particularly if you have even black box access to the system, right? Because you can just try and see what happens uh, in a testing environment. Uh, and then the learn ones where we just learned some regexes off from packet uh, captures uh, work pretty much all the time, except one corner case for Enpro for one protocol. The funniest thing we thought was that the proprietary system was the most aggressive at labeling things as uh, the, the, the fake target protocol. And, and so much so that we were actually worried that the thing was misconfigured. Um, it was, I don't know, it was, it was startling. But you know, in hindsight, it makes sense, actually. These guys are competing on like speed and performance and stuff. They do very minimalistic checks, and they're really, really trying to get uh, uh, you know, the most coverage in a benign setting, right? They really don't think about this stuff at all. So uh, it was by far the easiest to fool. OK, uh, just in terms of, of speed, yeah? Did you uh, 
Yeah, give me two slides. <laughs> so uh, just to, to show that, so one of our target goals here is to be fast, right? So we're really looking at the performance end of the spectrum, and so here's just a CDF of the uh, human distribution function uh, of the uh, download times of the you know, top 50 Alexa sites um, in seconds. So this is like for the whole page download, so we're really waiting for the whole page download. Uh, this is just a regular like SSH tunnel, and this is for our various regexes. Some of them have a little bit more overhead, like the uh, the learned. These are the learned regexes are, are not as space efficient, um, so they have some kind of more cruft in them. Uh, but definitely still very performant. Uh, we can uh, essentially match. Or in some cases, Kevin's implementation is actually better than the SOX uh, regular implementation, which is kind of funny. But uh, as do some system systems that are not really relevant. But anyway, it's very fast. Okay, so you can definitely use this. Okay, so we added, uh, by we, I mean Kevin again, added uh, this record layer to Tor as a, as a plug with transport so that you can put FT on everything that's going out over the wire. And we, in fact, uh, just as a proof of concept, it's kind of a low hanging proof of concept because we don't expect it. We, our prior definitely expected this to work, but uh, it was still fun to do. You can rent a you know, virtual private server in, uh, in one of these countries. We, we chose China um, and uh, deployed the NFT client there that was running Tor. Um, and you know, set up a, a custom Tor proxy that you know, uh, ran the FT pro, uh, system uh, on the other end. And uh, you know, confirmed that uh, in this setting, and in fact, this, you know, to actually download Tor, we had to actually use F NFT tunnel because you can't go to the Tor site from in China. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so anyway, so once we got Tor set up, it's definitely blocked still. They have this very interesting, very sophisticated um, setup now with, uh, with the, the Great Firewall of China. That, you know, they actually look at TLS connections that go by and they actually uh, end up now mounting, um, for TLS connections, they mount this active uh, probing attack, attack in your perspective, I suppose. But uh, they queue up uh, uh, the IP addresses they see that uh, are for certain types of TLS connections. Uh, and then later, they actually try to connect to the TLS, uh, to the IP address, as a Tor client. Uh, this is a very effective way of figuring out if something's actually running Tor at the other end, because uh, the Tor client, the Tor server's like, yeah, of course I talk Tor, and you know, comes back, and then they blacklist that IP address for some period of time. Um, uh, and you know, that happens, and happens to us. So that eventually, the blocks go down again. But uh, uh, anyway, so uh, and then once you uh, once you incorporate FT, of course, the, this is like totally fine. Uh, they they, uh, they definitely never block. We ran it for like a month or something. And of course, until they actually try to start blocking, we don't expect anything to happen, but uh, we think it's going to be very hard. You, you are not planning to visit China soon, are you? I actually am not, I guess, but you know, be happy to go talk to people. Um, so, uh, anyway, so. Uh, Right, anyway, so Kevin's been working very hard with the Tor team to, uh, to actually get this in the main, main Tor bundle so that people can, can use it uh, in, you know, easily and wouldn't have to download and compile stuff. And that sounds like it's on track, but I haven't heard the latest news on when, when it's going to go in. Okay, good. Uh, so, see, I got 15 minutes to, and I got like 40 more slides or something, but I think maybe we should cut it off. Um, so last uh, topic was about doing uh, uh, encryption that supports deduplication, and I'll let you look at the slides uh, for that. You can check out some papers online about it. So let me uh, here like give you just a sneak peek of what you can look at later. It's amazing. Wow. There I am again. Uh, good, 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 good. Yeah, it's fast. Yeah, there are some insecurity issues. Bummer. Oh, that sucks. That's cool. That's really cool with bad performance uh, Google. Okay, so uh, just let me conclude with some, some concluding thoughts very briefly. So, uh, um, so I think there's a few things that I think are, are interesting in doing this type of research, and, and I would encourage more people to do this type of research. When I say this type of research, I mean really trying to treat cryptography, applied cryptography as a systems problem, right? There's lots of technologies. Cryptography doesn't live in an abstract space. There's like real adversaries and real systems that we need to work with. And if you understand those technologies, then you can realize that there's gaps in, in our crypto suites, right? Things that we d haven't figured out how to do before, or things that industry people have been asking for, but we haven't helped them analyze, like with FP is a classic example of that. Um, uh, or even things like simple things, like password-based encryption, right, that uh, was not analyzed for a long time, and our definitions had no way to express 
the security that uh, was seen to be targeted. So there's lots of cool problems out there. Uh, and, and one of the things that you end up uh, doing in these types of, in, in looking at this stuff, is that you realize our definitions are not sacrosanct, and they're actually something that we have to keep shifting and changing, our security definitions, right? And one has to get very comfortable with the idea that you actually iterate on the security definitions quite a bit. And that's a hard thing to do, because obviously as you change definitions, if you get it wrong, everything you prove or analyze is bogus. So uh, yeah, uh, so that's my closing thoughts, I guess. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll leave it there. I think uh, you would have want some uh, final, or are there any final questions, I guess, before I stop? I was like, God, let's get it over with. OK. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, so just uh, wanted to uh, conclude by uh, saying that the reason we come is for the content, and there's a lot of work involved in preparing four full days of lectures, and it only falls on a, only a few people, so I think we should all thank uh, the speakers for all of their efforts and their hard work and uh, the great content they gave us. So let's do that. our ability to, uh, to see, hear, eat, enjoy, uh, sleep, travel, and do everything that was due to your organization. So let's thank you. Very much.